So in this video, we're going to be talking about how it all comes tumbling down. So what is the third century crisis? It's not one thing. The key thing about the third century crisis is that it is a confluence of crises. Everything goes wrong at once. And so it, there is a combination of catastrophes that all befall the Roman Empire during the third century, during the 200 CE. So the first part of this is perpetual political chaos. The most obvious manifestation of this is the revolving door principle in which there is a constant succession of emperors. And all of this is, is, uh, is showing that uh, the empire... Uh, is is unstable at the top, but it's not just the emperors. Uh, there is political instability all through the Roman political system, and this is this is causing major problems for uh, safety and stability. It's causing major problems for defense. It's causing major problems for the economy because uh, economies cannot thrive in an unstable political environment. Um, the second uh, aspect of this is that there is an economic catastrophe separate from this, which has to do with you know the collapse of the Roman economy uh, for a number of reasons. Primarily, um, the uh, the the debasement of the currency and the uh, the the subsequent massive impact on trade, and a major series of of plagues and natural disasters that cause a huge disruption to the Roman economy. But the point is, the Roman economy essentially collapses and remains, uh, um, and remains in this more uh, deadly moribund state for, for decades. And, and that has a, an accruing, an accumulating impact apart from the economic disaster itself. The third aspect of this is military catastrophe. Um, the Roman Empire is invaded from multiple directions, and because of the other crises, the empire is not able to uh, to defend itself. And so, as a result, the the Roman Empire comes in in uh, uh, in close proximity uh, to to imminent uh, imminent disaster, imminent collapse, um, and the the end of of the Roman world, uh, you know, on all of these three fronts. Um, the, the Roman Empire is in danger of being taken over and, and all but conquered. Um, it's in danger of collapsing politically and economic. All three of these things should be the end of the story. Um, on top of that, there's also cultural disruption that's related to the economic disruption, the military disruption, but also to other social and religious factors um, uh, that is causing the you know this empire of of people that have uh, in some ways very little in common um, to uh, to you know apart from the strength of the Roman economy and the the leadership of Rome. So all of this, uh, you know, comes crashing down, and you know everything's falling apart, and invasion, and and, uh, and failure of the economy, and 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 loss of, of inspirational leadership. Um, the, the 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 empire is breaking apart into its uh, component fragments, um, and is unable to work together to uh, to resolve the issue from the ground level either. And so, um, once again, this should be the end of the story. We should be ending the semester right here. Um, uh, so, one of the things that uh, is often said about the Roman Empire, it is, is that you know it is not remarkable that it fell when it finally falls in the Western side in the fifth century. It's not remarkable that the Roman Empire falls in the fifth century. It's remarkable that it um, perseveres and stays together for you know the, as long as it does. Essentially, the Roman Empire endures. It's created halfway through the Republic. You know, the Roman Empire endures in the West for 750, 800 years, and it, you know it endures beyond that for another thousand years uh, in the East. So, what we want to look at it here is. Why does the third century crisis happen? What does it involve? What are the ramifications of all these crises? And how does it survive despite all of this? And we'll be, uh, we'll be looking at that this week and next week. Okay, so there are a million things that go into this set of confluing um, catastrophes that are all interconnected with each other. On the political side, we have uh, the failure of the, the Severan dynasty in that uh, they didn't produce another Severan. So we're not just talking about the end of the Severan dynasty doesn't continue past Elagabalus and Severus Alexander. They don't produce another Severus after Septimus Severus at the beginning. So in other words, 
um, the 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 concept of the Principate isn't able to sustain itself even within this dynasty. They're unable to succeed in a way that uh, that brings capable people to the uh, to the leadership of the empire. Possible success, uh, exception to this is Caracalla, but call it Caracalla because um, he is uh, divisive and, and factional. He's a he's a uh, he's a champion of the military. Uh, is part of the problem. Um, but so uh, the the principle of the of the principate uh, fails, you know, with the arrival of the of, of Septimus Severus, who's supposed to be creating a whole new stable platform. That doesn't happen. Um, the legitimacy of imperial rule starts to suffer under people that are not uh, earning their respect, not able to um, to bring all the constituencies of the Romans together. In other words, the, the, the emperors, even under the severans, are not earning the faith and trust of the people, um, the, uh, the army and the nobility. Um, the internal tensions are rising as a result of this. We see this under Commodus, and in fact, it's happening under the Nerwa Antonines. The Nerwa Antonines have such good press that the negative aspects of divisiveness and faction within the nobility and at the uh, at the at the social level in Italy and throughout the, pro and the throughout the provinces um, is papered over by how amazing these men are. Um, it becomes visible under Commodus and is rife uh, under the uh, under the Severans. Um, as a result, we have uh, conflicting uh, bases of power that lead to rivalry uh, for succession. We see this immediately after Commodus, but uh, this remains permanently the case. Uh, Septimus Severus and especially his successors are, uh, are, are, have trouble holding on to the, uh, the loyalty of all of their commanders. The imperial hierarchy has inherent problems. There's no mechanism for succession. Mechanism for succession depends entirely upon the uh, you know the ad hoc actions of whoever happens to be the current emperor. So there's no there's no mechanism for creating an emperor, uh, and there's no mechanism for removing one. There's still um, very little uh, in terms of of hierarchy under the emperor. Um, part of this is there's a lack of a civil service that uh, creates a self perpetuating infrastructure, despite the efforts of certain emperors that were inclined in this direction, particularly Hadrian. Um, there really isn't a an empire apart from the emperor and the governors. And the governors are all on an equal level, which means that they are all uh, in conflict with each other. They're all in rivalry with each other. And one step up from that, uh, to rise above the other governors, one step up from that is to be the emperor. So there's a built-in, uh, uh, you know, there's a built-in lure to uh, for for governors to to seek their precedence by marching on Rome. Uh, in terms of the military situation, so one of the things you want to look back at is, is going all the way back to Marcus Aurelius. Uh, the the Roman Empire has been you know waging very large, expensive wars, and you know of course uh, even further, uh, you know you look at um, at Trajan. You know the 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 empire is going on these aggressive, offensive wars. Um, Hadrian tries to pull that back, but uh, subsequent emperors and and uh, you know even Marcus Aurelius, who's you know reasonably modern on this, on this point, is engaged in very large, expensive wars on multiple fronts. And under the Severans, this becomes policy to engage in as much war as possible in order to uh, keep the military happy. And this leads to um, this in addition to the expense of the, all these new legions and the, the number of legions that there are already, um, the expense of war is massive. So we have, uh, you know, we have pressure on the frontiers from, from the outside, um, which involves the... Uh, all of these wars uh, that have resulted in, you know, the you know sharp defense of Roman territory, and once again, Hadrian makes his policy to sort of shut down the frontiers and create this us versus them uh, mentality, in which the people on the other side, the them, 
are you know able to accumulate this sense of being excluded from the strongest economy of the world, um, excluded from all this wealth and and prosperity, and their only access to it is therefore going to be by attack. Um, and so this breeds barbarian confederacies. This breeds you know people beyond the Roman frontiers are ganging up together to try to find a way to uh, attack Roman territory and take away Roman wealth. Um, in addition to this, this pressure is compounded by the movement of migratory tribes. So uh, we remember going back to the, the time of Marius, we had um, the movement of the Cimbri and the Teutones, uh, nations of people that are moving across Europe and creating a threat through the, the sheer force of their numbers and their capacity to, to take over territory um, simply through the size of these nations that are on the move. This is happening again. Indo-European peoples are always moving out of the Indo-European homeland. That's where the Italians come from in the first place. Um, and now we have uh, movements of Slavs and Germans that are pushing um, the existing peoples uh, uh, against Roman territory, and this is uh, this is creating conflict at uh, um, the the outskirts of the of the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, in particular, there is a revolution that takes place in Persia, which uh, in which a a new and powerful Persian Empire is created that is an even greater challenge to Rome. Under the Parthians, the Romans had been unable to do much to defeat the Parthians, but the Parthians hadn't been aggressive in trying to uh, trying to take Roman territory. The Sasanians, the new Persian Empire, is is more hostile to the Romans and more interested in taking away the wealth that exists in the Roman East. Um, uh, all of this uh, creates a, a massive amount of pressure on the imperial treasury, and there's so there's not enough um, there's not enough uh, soldiers, there's not enough um, representatives of the of the Roman political structure to handle all this pressure on the frontier. There's certainly not enough money to pay for um, you know the, the the legions and and conflicts that exist, much less the building up of of either, even greater military trouble. Um, the civil wars amongst the uh, the, the governors uh, compound the, the military chaos, of course. And then in the economic sphere, at the same time, we have um, the rising cost of the military, which I've already talked about, the debasement of coinage, which I'll talk more about in a second, uh, and you know the, the, the need to tax, to create uh, more revenue, to, uh, to, to fill up the treasury, which is rapidly emptying because of the cost of military and the other infrastructure of the Roman government, you know, civil works and so forth spread throughout the Roman Empire um, and subsidies and so forth for, uh, for local territories. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we saw this happening uh, under um, under Caracalla, the part of the motivation for extending the citizenship to all the free peoples of the Roman Empire is to broaden the tax base uh, immensely, and uh, uh, the 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 effort to use taxation to bring about uh, desperately needed revenue um, uh, ex accelerates throughout this period with massive impact on the Roman economy. That level of taxation is chilling to the economy, um, and it's self-perpetuating, uh, which is to say, as the economy slows down because of overtaxation, uh, the result is that less taxes are being collected. Um, there's a there's a, a massive plague that uh, wipes out a number of of cities in in Italy and other European provinces, uh, and this has a huge knock on effect. Um, um, there's a resulting famine which spreads even wider, and the the plague is devastating in terms of population, and the as a result of this, this means that. You know, with the reduction in population, there's fewer taxpayers, um, there's fewer laborers, there's, there's less in terms of skilled labor, um, fewer things are being produced, fewer things are being bought, um, and the economy essentially grinds to a halt because of this plague. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the level of taxation coming from Rome increases the pressure on locals. Um, this is also handed down to the level of provinces and the cities uh, in which the, um, the desperation of government 
is is visited upon the ordinary citizen with uh, with uh, with dire effects on their ability to keep the formerly vibrant Roman economy growing. Uh, and then on top of this, even more divisive and and uh, demonstrating uh, the, the 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 unsympathetic nature of Roman rule. Uh, is the persecution of the Christians, which happens sporadically through this period. It depends on the mentality of whoever happens to be uh, the emperor, and certain emperors are fixated on destroying the Christian movement as a negative influence on Roman culture uh, and on the stability of the empire, and we'll talk more about this in the next video. So the political anarchy, uh, political anarchy is what's most famous about this period. But it's in some ways it's a it's a it's a symptom and a, and a consequence of the things that are wrong with the Roman Empire during this period. And so we have, uh, you know, we have all you know we have a number of men who you know are well meaning uh, and are capable. Uh, and you know would would tell interesting stories, except that they are killed and replaced within a matter of you know within a matter of months or years, and so we have this this rapid succession you know through you know the first uh, uh, the sixty seventy years of the of the third century, in which you know the 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 Roman Empire is demonstrably politically unstable, and that feeds upon itself. That's part of the problem with the third century crisis. All of the factors that are involved in it feed upon itself and, and become worse and worse and worse. This political uh, anarchy means that you know, the, the thing that holds the empire together, faith and trust in this man who sits on the cubicle chair in Rome, is, uh, is, is not present. Nobody trusts anybody in Rome and the the breakdown of the empire is underway even before we have these massive invasions from the from the west and from the east to the point that as we see in this map the Roman empire is starting to shrink down uh, and you know is in danger of being you know is being lost entirely if if because the, the Romans aren't in any kind of position to to rally the situation and to fight back there's there's no political leadership there's no military leadership um there's uh, there's the the military forces of the empire are under the command of individual generals uh, who are now no longer working with each other because they're all in rivalry for the throne. And so you know we see the uh, we see you know later authors like Zosimus who are writing about this as you know demonstrably. Uh, uh, inviting the trouble that the the Romans are undergoing, uh, and interestingly, you know the 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 why of this, why there's such political anarchy, uh, is is often put down to the, uh, the 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 faulty caliber of the individuals who are at the top of Roman society. Uh, the sense is that uh, you know this is we have long since lost the days of an Augustus or a Marcus Aurelius, and you know there is the the evaporation of that faith and trust means that you know the the unity of the empire is uh, is is defunct and meaningless. So a little bit about Roman coinage. Um, the aureus is uh, is the gold coin seldom seen. Um, the the workhorse coin is the denarius and the sestertius. So uh, the denarius and the sestertius are the the main coins that you hear about in um, in in the literature and that you see examples of. So you notice the aureus that we happen to have a sample of here. This one happens to have Antoninus Pius on it. The uh, denarius, this one happens to have Marcus Aurelius on it. And the Cistertius has Vespasian on it. Each coin would have whoever was uh, in charge of the empire when the coin was being commissioned. Under the Republic, the, the, the Roman use of coinage starts to become widespread throughout the empire in the middle to late Republic. Under the Republic, um, coinage is commissioned by, you know, the, the, the prefect in charge of the mint 
for the city-state of Rome, and he can put whatever he wants on it. There's no, you know, official, uh, you know, iconography for coinage under the Republic. Uh, usually, the the reverse of the coin will have a standardized symbol like the um, anthropomorphic female image of Roma, uh, or something similar like that. Uh, and the obverse will have, you know, somebody that is of significance to the person who has commissioned the coins. And so, for example, a long time ago when we were talking about the triumvirate, uh, I showed you a coin that had Lepidus on it, which is actually essentially our only image of Lepidus. And the reason we have that coin is that one of his descendants decided to honor Lepidus by casting coins in his honor with his image on it. <clears throat> Once we get to the days of, actually, Julius Caesar, but especially Augustus, um, the the coins are commissioned with images in honor of the person in charge. So uh, it, under Julius Caesar's dictatorship, we have coins that show Julius Caesar dictator. Uh, and then under Augustus, from that point onward, we have Augustus. Um, Augustus also strikes coins in honor of Caesar himself. And uh, from that point onward, coinage always, the iconography of Roman coinage always reflects the, uh, the, the print caps, the, the monarch in charge. And this, is, this, this becomes the standard in this part of the world. From this point onward, um, coinage reflects the Roman model. It shows whoever is in charge at the time. And this becomes a very important tool for archaeologists and historians to, uh, to, to date the finds that are, are found through um, through archaeological digs, so the denarius is the is is the workhorse coin of the Roman world uh, in terms of its utility and prevalence. You can think of it as sort of the twenty dollar bill, uh, the sestertius, um, the dupundus. The copper ass is the coin for trivial transactions, and here we see Julius Caesar uh, being commemorated by Augustus. The denarius starts out being worth 10 asses, which is where the name comes from. Later on, it's uh, more like there are four asses to the sestertius and four sestertii to the denarius. But this varies over time and is sometimes reformulated. There's like 25 denarii in the aureus. And so the, the aureus is... Is is used only for you know transactions of luxury goods, but uh, ordinary everyday transactions would involve the denarius, the stertius, and the ass. And stop your snickering. Um, so what we see happening during this period is a process of debasement, in which uh, the coins are made to be less uh, composed of the metals that they are supposed to be. This had happened periodically, going you know all the way back to the Julio Claudians on rare occasions, uh, but uh, under the under the third century crisis, uh, beginning with the, the Severans, actually, um, we see periodic resorting to the uh, to the debasement of coinage. This brings up an important point. I mentioned the twenty dollar bill. Uh, the twenty dollar bill is actually not worth twenty dollars. It's uh, you know just a piece of paper. But the the coins of the ancient world are supposed to be worth their actual metal content. And so uh, the problem is that uh, when you produce coins, um, their you know their their actual value can become disconnected to their metal content, and that creates the conditions for uh, depression and for in inflation. Once again, we see this with modern American coinage. Um, the the penny started out as a copper coin, and uh, uh, originally it was it was meant to be significant. Uh, of you know roughly a cent's worth of copper, but you know also you know also uh, representative of, of a fixed monetary value. Um, over time, the price of copper has become such that uh, it would be massively much more expensive than a single cent to produce a copper penny. And so the, uh, the, the pennies that we have are now mostly zinc. Um, you might have noticed that uh, quarters are also a lot less heavy than they used to be, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so we see this in, you know, in, in the modern world, but 
because the coins and paper that we use are symbolic, it doesn't have this kind of impact. It doesn't produce uh, a skyrocketing inflation. Uh, what happens in the ancient world is that, you know, the, the coin is debased, it uh, is less pure, and as a result of that, people know that it's worth less, and so prices go up, and, uh, uh, the, uh, and as a result, you know, the money that comes into the government is worth less, and people have, you know, a fixed number of coins often, so, you know, there's only so many coins in circulation, so less stuff is being bought, and the economy slows down because of skyrocketing prices, and the, you know, the, the amount of taxation produces less, so the taxes go up, and so that slows down the economy as well, and then, you know, the, there's a need to, uh, to do something about that. The treasury is emptying, and so they go back and debase the coins again, and uh, this has a, uh, has a, a cascading cyclical effect that gets much, much, much worse. Um, the example here on the screen is the uh, Antonianus, which is a two denarius coin that's introduced by Caracalla, and it's an example of debasement when it's actually introduced, because uh, when it's introduced, it only has one and a half denarii worth of silver, uh, you know, when it first comes out. And then um, every decade, it's produced less and less uh, uh, in terms of purity, so it has less and less silver until, um, uh, until you know, within 30 years of, of its introduction, this coin is almost worthless and contains next to no silver. Uh, and we can see on, on this chart that this is a, uh, that this, this is a problem that becomes rapidly uh, uh, regressive. Uh, during the 200s, during the uh, the third century crisis, um, to the point where at the end of the third century crisis, Roman coinage um, is is useless. Uh, the economy is essentially dead because of debasement, because of overtaxation, because of the plague. Um, and in, you know, coincidentally or not, this is the period in which emperors are being killed. Uh, you know. The, not because people are killing them because their coins are worthless, but because everything is is collapsing and and the faith and trust of the government has has uh, has been completely undermined. And the way out of this, uh, you know, Constantine and Diocletian essentially have to introduce an entirely new currency system and and rebuild the economy from scratch, as we'll see next week. So the economic fallout from all this, um, there's an inflationary spiral that keeps feeding upon itself. Um, there's a shortfall in precious metals as people are hoarding um, the actual you know, silver and gold and electrum and so forth that they actually have, as well as uh, metals that are used in manufacture. Um, coins are being kept in, metal is being kept in, and so uh, the, the economy is not circulating, it's not moving. Um, and so there's a decline in things being produced, there's a decline in things being purchased, um, there's a decline in things that are being moved from one place to another, everything comes grinding to a halt. Um, the, the, the demand for manufactured goods goes down because people uh, don't have money uh, to buy things. Um, they don't have jobs or they don't have coins. And so uh, uh, factories shut down and people are thrown out of work and, and um, this uh, cascades upon itself. Um, as a result, there's a depletion in skilled labor. And so the ability to actually do fundamental things in the economy, you know, things like uh, metalworking and, uh, and, and architecture and so forth uh, and uh, engineering, all these things that uh, involve skilled labor. Uh, people don't uh, have apprentices. They don't have people carrying on their businesses in, in towns, villages, and cities. And so, you know, the skilled labor starts to actually falter and even die out in certain places because of depopulation, because of the failure of the economy. Um, act, and of course, disruption of agriculture. There's fewer people because of uh, because of the plague, um, to uh, to harvest and to to till the fields, uh, more people are leaving places that are massively affected by the collapse of the economy, and so um, and so migration away from territories, uh, you know, kills the places that are being migrated from, and so forth and so on. 
And so uh, the, the desperation involved in all of this is leading to increased tax levies at the imperial level and at the local level um, because the, the costs that the government is bearing uh, don't go away, including the massive cost of, of all the legions of the Roman Empire as well as everything else. Um, the Roman Empire becomes unable to pay the wages of its soldiers, and the uh, the legions end up being forced to requisition goods in kind uh, just to feed their soldiers. And this has a, a, a huge effect on the ability of the legions to defend the frontiers. This is one of the reasons why the invasions during this time are so immensely successful. And the outcome of all of this is, well, like I said, this should be the end of the story. But uh, a number of things start to happen that build toward a new empire emerging out of this. And we'll talk more about that in the next video and next week. And for now, that's that.